This is the Hustlers Corner. Shout out to all crypto hustlers out there. Shout out to all crypto hustlers out there. It's Buddha Buddha Arch here. The first thing I'd like for you guys to do is to, to go straight to that shop shop sign on the count of one, two, three. Let's click that button. Click, 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 click. I appreciate you guys. Secondly, let's go over there to that subscribe button, guys. Press that subscribe button. Click. I appreciate you quite interesting and the reason why I did this video is because it's my 10th video when I did my first video on the 1st of August 2021 Bitcoin was sitting at 41,000 US dollars you can go to my first video and check it out today is the 10th of August the day after Women's Day Bitcoin is sitting at 46,000 US dollars meaning in the past 10 days or just a little over a week not even 10 days from the first to the 10th that's like nine days right it has gone up by 20 percent meaning if you had a hundred rand just sitting on bitcoin not trading or not even knowing nothing about it just like me who doesn't know much about it my, my bitcoin is just sitting there while i'm learning you basically had 20 percent returns returns in about a week so if you had a thousand rands you've made an extra what 200 rands if you had 10,000 rands you've made an extra 2,000 rands if you had 10,000 rands or if you had a hundred thousand rands you've made an extra 20,000 rands if you had a million in Bitcoin just over the past week sitting you not doing anything you literally have made 20% returns meaning if you had a million sitting in Bitcoin you've literally made 200,000 by the way, let me just throw in a disclaimer over there. I'm not a financial expert. I'm not a financial advisor. I know nothing about giving people advice. I'm also brand new in this cryptocurrency space. And as I'm learning, I'm learning with you. But it's a beautiful thing that it's digital currency. A lot of people are still skeptical about it. It goes up and down. The market is still volatile. And there's a lot of scammers out there, guys. Be very careful. Don't give your money to anybody. Anybody that promises to double, quadruple, or triple your uh, monies, or, and they're coming to say the nicest things on your DMs, they are lying. Be careful of all the scammers out there. So what I wanted to say on this video is the future is beautiful. Digital real estate, Bitcoin. Some of those who understand it, and as I, I keep going, I'm starting to understand it. Michael Saylor, Michael Saylor is one of the big boys. I think he's the longest lasting CEO of any listed companies based in the US. He's an incredible brother. You can go to YouTube, go check him out, go Google him, Michael Saylor. He basically holds on behalf of his shareholders and his company, MicroStrategy, billions in Bitcoin. So he basically understands it and he's been following it for many, many years. Us who are still new and still learning, we're learning from people like him. So I have attached a video that I'd like for you to listen to. So if you are interested or you are somebody who's in real estate or property or you're into investments, Bitcoin is for long-term investors. If you want to get into this game for a short paper or a quick money game, this is not for you unless you have to really, really understand it. That's why I'm trying to take my time. I'm trying to understand it. And as I go along learning it, I want to learn it with you. So before I start investing a lot of money, I want to understand it. And I'm encouraging you to learn it with me. So I'm, I've attached a video of Michael Saylor talking about how you can get rich of Bitcoin or what rich people are doing. Now, remember, Bitcoin, as he says, it's like the future digital real estate. And if you look at the, um, the amount of um, returns Bitcoin has been giving since its existence, it's, a, it's been growing at an average of at least a minimum of 20% per year. And I've just heard interesting things that if you have got a Bitcoin bank in your country, I don't know if we do in South Africa, you can actually borrow against your Bitcoin. That is great news. So I don't want to say much because I'm not a financial advisor. I'm also listening to people like him, but I just want you guys to check out this video. I don't think you should spend property. I, I think that this is a fundamental misconception people have. They keep thinking they have to spend it or it has to be, has to have a use or utility for it to have value. The reason they think that is because they've never been rich. Like, I, I mean, it's really non-rich people that think that. For example, if my family had bought up 20 blocks of Manhattan 200 years ago, would I, I have to spend 
my real estate on coffee for the, for, does Manhattan have to have value? Like, like, isn't it obvious that owning all of Manhattan and not giving away any of it for 200 years is probably a better investment, a better idea, right? It's property. Like, how, how about Robert Kraft? He owns, you know, the New England Patriots. Does he spend 1% of the New England Patriots to buy coffee? Does he give it away every year so it will have value? No, he owns it. Is he given, what's he going to do with it? Give it to his kids if he, if he can, right? It's a dynastic thing. The United States doesn't give away its land to foreign countries to buy coffee, right? So if you have real wealth, if you have a franchise, if you own Manhattan, if you actually own, like Jeff Bezos didn't get rich by spending Amazon stock on coffee. Jeff Bezos got rich by not spending Amazon stock. Larry Ellison still owns Oracle. You know, how did he do it? He borrowed against it, right? Rich families, rich countries, they borrow or they, or they, uh, they generate yield on it, right? If I own Manhattan, I can either borrow against it or I can let you build a building on it, but I keep ownership of the underlying property. A lot of the property in, uh, in Europe, uh, the noble families, like the Prince of Wales, whatever, they own the land underneath London, and then people that have buildings, they don't own their land. They have a 100-year lease or a ground lease or a 200-year lease or a 50-year lease, but they don't actually own the property, right? Sometimes the government owns the property. And in UAE, it's illegal for a foreigner to buy uh, land on the beach. I think all of the prime beachfront property, it's impossible for a foreigner to buy it. It's against the law. So, so if you think, once you understand property, you understand that it, if I gave you a billion dollars of property, you could pretty much just stay rich forever and you don't have to spend the property. All you got to do, borrow money at 2% interest against the property, invest it in the S&P that yields 10%, scrape the 8% yield, never sell the stock, never sell the land, just live, you're living off of rent or arbitrage off the energy. And that, that's, I think, I think uh, VJ understands that what VJ would say is the reason that Bitcoin is good money is because there is no utility value for it other than as money. Like if, if gold is not a good thing to monetize because it has value as jewelry and corn right. is not a good thing to monetize because it has value okay. as food. And a house is not a good idea to monetize it because there's value to live in. You want to monetize something which has which is 100% monetary premium, and and to to be a 100% monetary premium, you don't have to spend it. I think the the big the big idea that people just don't get is they don't understand that under inflation, money decomposes into a currency and an asset. So in a non-inflationary environment, this is first principles reasoning. Mm -hmm. If the U.S. dollar was never printed, if the U.S. dollar was not inflationary, then it would be a store of value and it would be a medium of exchange and it would be a unit of account. But when I decide to print 10% more dollars every year, it becomes a medium of exchange, a union of account, but the store of value disappears and it drifts and the store of value becomes sovereign debt or gold or, or S&P 500 stocks or equity or Bitcoin, something. So when the, when the dollar inflates 20% a year, it's pretty clear the currency is no longer a store of value. When the currency inflates at 80% a year, it's not, a, you know, it's losing its value within six months, you know? And so it starts to just totally break down. If you understood that, once you, once you get that idea, you realize that for Bitcoin to have value, you don't have to spend it, you have to hold it. And, and the way that you execute your life is you, um, you fund your, your checking account or your, you fund your working capital by borrowing or generating yield off of your asset. 
So uh, I have a uh, million dollars of Bitcoin. I borrow $10,000 against it. I don't sell the Bitcoin. I pay 3% interest. Bitcoin goes up 10 or 20% a year. I keep uh, funding a USD checking account against my BTC savings account. And then the asset will go up faster than my rate of expenditures. For that to work, all I need is a bank that will either generate yield for me or it will give me low interest loans. So you need Bitcoin bank. <clears throat> every rich person in the world, every wealthy person, they have billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of assets. They have banks and the banks are gonna give them uh, financing at LIBOR plus 50 basis points against their equity portfolios or LIBOR plus 200 basis points against their yacht, or LIBOR plus, plus 100 basis points against this, or they're financing their business at, at the junk bond. Every business can borrow money at 4% interest in the junk bond market, right? And so, or they're going to banks, and they're saying, I have a billion dollar building, and they're refinancing it with a building construction loan at 3% or 4% interest. So they're all continually financing their assets with a mixture of, of debt instruments in order to avoid capital gains, in order to avoid income tax, and in order to avoid shrinking their asset portfolio. Because if I have $10 billion of real estate, and if you can predict that the Fed is gonna print 7% more money a year, and if the real estate's in New York and it's scarce, can't you reasonably assume that the real estate's going to go up by 7% a year? Of course. And doesn't that mean that your $10 billion of real estate is going to be worth an extra $700 million next year? And doesn't that mean that you can refinance it and you can take $100 million a year out of that at 2% or 3 or 4% interest tax-free forever? This is The Hustler's Corner.